Hey everybody, today we're gonna to be doing section 8.2, which is on human impacts on ecosystems. The learning objective for today is that you can describe the impacts of human activities on aquatic ecosystems. So we're focusing on aquatics today. We will focus on all other ones throughout this unit though. So the essential knowledge that you're gonna be gaining today is how organisms have a range of tolerance, which we have talked about in the past units, but we'll talk about it specifically with pollutants today. We're also going to be focusing on coral reefs and how humans are negatively impacting them. And then also looking at oil spills and how oil can cause consequences for aquatic ecosystems. So a range of tolerance, which I know we've talked about at least a couple times this year. Um, but just a reminder that the range of tolerance is the fact that organisms have range of tolerance for abiotic conditions in their habitat. This could be pH, temperature, salinity, sunlight, nutrient levels all the things they have different ranges for. But organisms also have a range of tolerance for pollutants that human activities release into habitats. Now an FRQ tip is when you are talking about pollutants and the effects that they have on organisms, you wanna make sure that you're very specific. You don't wanna just say they harm organisms, but like what specifically is gonna happen? And this right here is actually gonna give you a pretty good list of them and it also just gives us a good awareness of what can happen when these organisms are outside their range of tolerance due to pollutants specifically. Now they can cause psychological stress by things such as limited growth, um, limited reproductive function, causing them difficulty um, breathing, especially if you think of like fish and their gills or things like that. It can also lead to potential asphyxiation where they're gonna actually suffocate from these pollutants can also cause hormonal disruptions, which we will talk about further in our unit. And it can also cause death. However, especially with FRQs, you wanna be careful. Death is only gonna occur if it's in concentrations of pollutants that are really high. So you don't wanna just automatically say, well, if there's pollutants, they're gonna die. Cause you have to be specific that it has to get to levels that are going to kill it. Because sometimes it's just going to limit their reproductive functioning or it's just going to limit their growth or they aren't going to die from it. They're just not going to be thriving. So just kind of be aware that death isn't always what's occurring here. And you kind of need to be specific that the pollutants have to be at high enough concentrations in order for death to occur. Now, a big theme of unit eight, especially when it comes to um, just what we're going to talk about, if anything comes up on the AP exam, anything we're going to be doing where I'm questioning you in this class, a big theme is that we need to be able to explain specific effects of pollutants on organisms. So as I said, this is a really good list. Honestly, maybe put like a big star just around all of this for unit eight, because this is where we're getting an example of some of the very specific ways that pollutants can affect organisms. All right, now we're gonna focus a little bit on coral reefs, like I said, we were gonna talk about. One of the things that's really impacting for coral reefs is they have a very specific temperature tolerance. Now, if you aren't very familiar with the coral reefs and what they are, a coral reef actually is a mutualistic relationship between coral and a photosynthetic algae. The algae supplies the sugar and the coral supplies the carbon dioxide for that algae to do photosynthesis. So actually, if you looked on the left-hand side here, coral is technically, it's a living organism. It's considered an animal. And coral is going to be like the animal here. And inside, you're seeing that it has a symbiotic relationship with this algae. Now, algae are the ones that have a narrow temperature tolerance. And if a reef gets too warm, which happens with ocean levels, right, or ocean temperatures rising, the algae will actually say like, this is not a place I'm thriving and I'm leaving. So in a healthy coral, we're gonna see very colorful coral because of this algae in the symbiotic relationship. When they get stressed though, the algae starts leaving and eventually the coral is going to get bleached. Bleached coral basically means it's dying because the coral animal dies really quickly without the sugar supplied from the algae. Um, and so that's what actually causes coral bleaching. When we look at corals dying and their bleaching occurring, that's what it is. Now, pollutants from runoff, such as sediment, pesticides, and sunscreen can also force algae from the reef. So it's not just temperature tolerance. They can be angry about a lot of different things. And all of these, again, are going to force the algae to leave the coral, which is then going to bleach the coral, and the coral is going to die because it doesn't have that sugar to provide it with food. 
Now, coral can lose their color and become stressed and vulnerable to, to disease without the algae. So, I mean, they are essentially going to end up starving to death because they don't have it, but they could also get diseased easier. Essentially, it's going to be a slow death for them, but without the algae, they're not going to be able to continue. So when you see that bright white bleached coral, it's basically a goner. Now, humans can have a lot of impacts on coral reefs. We predominantly, a big one that you're going to hear all of the time, especially in the news, is how it's our greenhouse gas emissions are causing the warming of ocean temperatures, which leads to coral bleaching. So a big one is going to be the fact that we're causing the ocean temperatures to get warmer, and that is going to be causing the coral bleaching and the infectious diseases and dying that is occurring because of these greenhouse gases. Now, another thing that we can do is we can actually overfish the coral reef population. So not like the reefs, the coral themselves, but the entire reef, which is normally a very thriving ecosystem. So we can decrease the fish populations by overfishing. Also bottom trawling, which is that practice where you take the net and you scrape it along the bottom. That can break reef structures and stir, stir up sediment, which is going to be a problem for all of the animals trying to do photosynthesis. Additionally, we have a lot of urban and agricultural runoff that can damage coral reef ecosystems. So one example is going to be sediment pollution. It's going to be carried down the river into the ocean, and it's going to cause the water to become more turbid. It'll be all cloudy, which means we're going to reduce the sunlight and the photosynthesis that's able to occur. We also have toxic substances, um, chemicals and sunscreen are actually one of them, oil from roadways, pesticides from agricultural runoff. You can kind of see in this diagram, there are a lot of places where all of this can be coming and eventually making its way into areas that are having the coral reefs. Another one is gonna be the nutrients like ammonia. So high nitrogen levels from animal waste or nitrates and phosphates from lawn fertilizers. And remember how that can lead to eutrophication, but also can just lead to nutrient levels being off from what this coral is used to. So now we're gonna focus on another aspect of ways that we can wreck aquatic ecosystems, and that's going to be oil spills. So hydrocarbons that are in crude oil, petroleum, are toxic to many marine organisms and can kill them, especially if they ingest it or if they absorb it through their gills or their skin. Now, not only is the actual crude oil itself going to be toxic, but there's quite a few other stressors, um, psychological stressors that can come from this. And that's going to be decreased visibility and decreased photosynthesis in the water when it's covered and mixed in with oil. Oil also sticks to bird feathers, which makes it so that they end up getting hypothermia, they end up ingesting it, they can't waterproof themselves. And oil also sinks to the bottom and then kills the bottom dwellers due to either direct toxicity or suffocation. Now this diagram here is gonna kind of show you like all the different ways that oil can go. You can get surface oil, you can get deep plumes of oil throughout, you can end up with it on the bottom, you can end up with it getting up along the shore, all these different organisms that are going to be impacted by it. So this kind of shows like the wide range of impacts from an oil spill and all the different parts of the ecosystem that can be impacted by it. Now another um, problem when it comes to the financial side of it is that oil can actually wash ashore and can decrease tourism revenue because nobody wants to be on an oily beach. It's also going to kill fish, which is going to decrease the fishing industry revenue and also hurt restaurants that serve fish. So not only is it bad for the ecosystems, but it's also bad for the humans who are relying on those ecosystems for their services and the things that are provided to them. Now, oil can also settle deep into root structures of estuary habitats like mangroves or salt marshes, which we see up in the top corner of this diagram right here. It can be toxic to salt marshes, grasses, which can just directly kill them as they're taking it in through their roots. It can also loosen up their root structure, leading to coastline erosion, which can remove habitats that are used by fish and shellfish for their breeding grounds, which again is bad for the organisms themselves but also bad for the humans who rely on the organisms that were originally thriving in these ecosystems. Now, when it comes to oil spill cleanup, we do have a variety of ways 
to try to address it. But it's important to realize that there's kind of two different ways that oil spills can occur. The first one is when an underwater oil well is going to explode. And that's going to be one where you're getting like plumes coming up from the bottom versus, well, and that happened in the BP Gulf spill, which is a very famous one from a few years back. Or another one is like when a tanker, so a big ship that has oil on it is going to run into a rock or an iceberg and it's punctured. And that's going to be more like on the surface is where most of it is going to be. And that happened with the Exxon Valdez. Now this one right here, um, be aware that this picture is showing you more of an oil well explosion because we see this oil plume coming down from the bottom up. So we've got it in the water column. And then because oil is less dense than water, it's making its way up to the top and you're getting it on the surface there. Now, there's a lot of different ways to try to deal with these cleanups. They can involve booms on the surface to contain the spread. So booms are going to be these like ways that they kind of block it from spreading anywhere else. Ships will have vacuum tubes that they try to literally suck the oil off the top, or they use devices to skim it, which you kind of see right here where these things are going to go through and the floating skimmer is going to try to remove the thin layer of oil from the surface. We also have physical removal of oil from beach sand, like scooping it up and throwing it away. We use towels, we use shovels, we use soaps to try to get it like off of the beach. We can also disperse chemicals, which you can see up at the top here with the airplane, where you're going to spray chemicals on the oil slicks and the chemicals are going to break up the oil and force it to sink to the bottom, which is great for getting it off the top of the water, but the problem is then it goes and smothers bottom dwellers. And these chemicals are kind of newer inventions. So we are starting to have some scientific studies coming out showing that the chemicals themselves can actually be harmful. Um, but that's sort of newer technology that we're looking into and improving. And then the last option, which you can imagine is not the greatest, but is one that we'll do, is where we actually literally like burn oil off the top of the surface. So you can see that in this middle picture here where they kind of have these floating boom barriers, and then they light it on fire to burn it off. So that's another strategy that we have, but clearly that's going to release some stuff into the atmosphere that we don't love. All right. So here's going to be your practice FRQ for 5.2. And for this one, you're going to be practicing the suggested skill of doing math to break down a problem. So the situation that we have here is the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge often called Anwar, on Alaska's North Slope is frequently in the news because petroleum geologists estimate that there are billions of barrels of economically recoverable oil beneath the surface of its frozen tundra. According to a 1988 United States Geological Survey estimate, Anwar could contain up to 10 billion barrels of technically recoverable oil. Oil company officials advocate opening the refuge to oil exploration and the subsequent development of its petroleum resources. Environmentalists argue that oil exploration and development will damage this fragile ecosystem and urge Congress to protect Anwar by designating it as a wild wilderness area. Fun fact, this has been something that has been argued in Congress by presidents, by environmentalists for decades now. We still fight about it. But anyway, so for your practice ever key for 5.2, here's going to be the setup for your math problem. The United States uses approximately 20 million barrels of oil per day. According to the USGS estimate, for how many days would the techni technically recoverable oil resource in the ANWR supply the total United States demand for oil? So you're going to use the information in that section of text that I gave you. You're going to set up the math equation. Make sure that you use your units. Make sure you use dimensional analysis. Your units will all cancel out. And you can give me a result at the very end where you showed me all of your work. But that's going to be a practice ever cute for 5.2. And those are your notes. Oh, not 5.2. That should say 8.2. Sorry, that's a typo. 8.2. How is your practice FRQ for 8.2? And those are your notes on 8.2.